starting the Montpelier Roxbury uh, Board of School Directors meeting at 6.32 on February 3rd. And let's do roll. Uh, Emma? Here. Bill? Here. Ryan? Here. Let's Andrew? Do, um, Here. Well, Mia? Starting the Montpelier Roxbury Present. Amanda, uh, Board of School Directors meeting at 6.32 Here, on okay. February 3rd. And Jerry? Let's do roll. Uh, Here. Emma? Um, here. Bill? Anna Kid here. Here. Ryan? Here. Let's Andrew, do um, the T. Here. Do, well, yeah. Yeah. Starting the uh, monthly Roxbury uh, uh, Board of School Directors meeting at 6.32 Here. on okay. February 3rd. <laughs> Uh, I Jim, think it said he couldn't. He couldn't make it. Okay. Is he the eight five zero number? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone I missed? You're all jumbled with the crowd. Okay. Excellent. Um, first order of business is public comment. Um, I know we were going to make some room for. Uh, Laura Merchant and Mary Zentara to talk during uh, public comment. So this is um, a time for you to go. Uh, anyone else as well? Um, and just a reminder, I know probably a lot of people want to talk about the, the SRO committee um, uh, presentation. Um, I just in, in terms of time, I want to just remind people we've, we've heard quite a bit on it. I don't want to stifle conversation at all, but we've heard quite a bit on it. And the students have uh, taken a lot of time to prepare a presentation. So um, if we could not um, uh, dwell on public comment too much, I think that would be considerate to um, the students and, the, and the, the committee and give the board kind of maximum time uh, to hear the presentation and ask questions. Um, so you know, feel free to, to give public comment, but if if it's largely repetitive of something you've said before, um, maybe um, either put it in an email or um, you know, realize that, that we've we've um, heard your your comments before. So, um, uh, Mary and Laura, why don't you go ahead? And anyone else who wants to give public comment, please raise your hand in the. Um, in the participant, if you hit on the participant uh, button at the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a raise hand function in the sidebar that comes out. Um, if that does not work for you, uh, after Mary and Lara go, um, just unmute yourself and shout out. I can't get everyone on the same screen, so I'm not going to necessarily see a raised hand. So, um, so Mary and Lara and uh, Remember, uh, even though I just said your names, uh, please introduce yourself, including your name for the camera once you go. Hi, I'm Lara Merchant, and I'm a parent of a student in the Montpelier Schools. And with me um, tonight is Mary Zentera. She's a fellow UVM grad student and also a Montpelier resident and parent. So when I first learned about the petition to remove the SRO position in the Montpelier Schools, I thought it was a really bad idea. And I wondered what would happen um, primarily in an active shooter situation if we didn't have an SRO. So I decided to do some research about SROs and see if they made schools any safer. And at the same time, students in my trauma grad course were also interested in the topic um, and learning what alternatives were available to schools instead of SROs. So it became the topic of our final project. In my research, I wasn't able to find anything that stated that schools are safer with SROs. And in fact, I found a lot to support the opposite. When I interviewed Montpelier Police Chief Brian Peak, he stated that if there is an active shooter, it's an odds game as to whether the SRO would be present in that school at that time, and that he would not promote that as a reason for having an SRO. So with that, and after learning more about trauma-informed practices, which includes racial trauma, I realized uh -huh. that my experiences and fear do not and should not trump someone else's experiences and fears. So being white and growing up in a virtually all white state, I was taught to trust our police officers and to go to them for help. And that was my experience. 
So the opposite is true for the Black community. Parents have to teach their, their children, particularly their boys, what not to do in the presence of a police officer in order to avoid being shot and killed. So what we're seeing in our country right now with police officers time and time again, killing black men and women, it might not be happening here in our community, but it doesn't remove the fear and trauma that police presence causes and the systemic problem that we have. There are doable alternatives to SROs. The school to prison pipeline is real. The ACLU states that black and brown youth are far more likely to be suspended, expelled, or arrested for the same kind of conduct in school than their white peers. Students who are suspended for at least 10 days are less likely to graduate and more likely to be arrested and incarcerated by their mid-20s. And once they're in the juvenile justice system, re-entry into school is difficult and the vast majority don't graduate from high school. So you can argue that SROs are needed to deal with truancy, runaways, crises in the classroom. However, do we really want an armed officer in this role when that can re-traumatize students? It is our understanding that the student resource officer in Montpelier is a professional, thoughtful, and caring community member. However, no one who works in or with the Montpelier Roxbury school system is immune to systemic racism. It lives in our bodies in the form of implicit biases. The mere presence of an armed, uniformed police officer could touch racial trauma in any one of our students, causing automatic nervous system activation. This trauma response is an adaptive normal response to an abnormal situation and can inhibit learning and the well being of some of our students. Maintaining the SRO advantages the safety and access to learning of some of our students over others in our school community. It is for this reason that we ask you to vote for the removal of the student resource officer and replace the position with trauma literacy for all staff and students in a trauma sensitive restorative school system. Thank you. Jim, you're, Jim, you were muted. Yeah, I, I yeah, saw you yeah, saying that. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, that was, was very helpful. Um, I see uh, Lizzie Fox also with her hand raised. Um, so Lizzie, go ahead. And again, please introduce yourself for Orca. Hi, thanks. My name is Lizzie Fox. Um, I'm a resident of Montpelier and a student teacher in another district. Um, I've also worked as a guest artist in Vermont schools through the Vermont Arts Council and other organizations for several years. Um, and as a writing instructor, I help students express themselves, own their own voices, and use creativity for social good. I love what I do, and I know that students learn best in spaces where they feel safe, supported, and included. I'm lucky to be student teaching in a district that uses restorative justice practices and does not have an SRO on staff. While there is always work to do to, toward becoming a more just and inclusive school, these practices model for students how communities can come together to heal rather than ostracizing individuals who may be struggling or further dividing students along lines of difference. Studies show us, as uh, was much more eloquently put by our last speaker, um, that SROs, no matter how well-intentioned or good-hearted they may be as individuals, as a profession are more likely to target and punish students of color, LGBTQ plus students, and students with disabilities. And they represent a key link in the school to prison pipeline. I know you've heard all of the statistics before, um, and I don't want to take up too much time or be redundant. Um, I'm grateful to this board for taking seriously the issue of SROs so far in this process, and I'm very grateful for the advocacy and hard work of the members of the Just Schools Initiative. Um, and I just wanted to, to further encourage you to, you know, keep on this path towards a more just community, voting to remove the SRO position once and for all from our school district and paving the way for more inclusive and just practices here in our community. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, that is the only hand I see raised. Um, so if anyone else wants to speak out, uh, either raise your hand now or just give a unmute yourself and give a shout out. Otherwise, we will move on to the consent agenda. 
Hi, right, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move that we approve the consent agenda with the addition of the warrant we received today. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Um, Emma. Aye. Jill. Aye. Brian. Aye. Andrew. Yes, aye. Mia. Hi, and I do have a question, but it's not like discussion or anything, so I can wait till after the vote. Oh, sorry. Um, Amanda? Yay. Jerry? Hi. Uh, I think I got everyone who is here, right? Um, yeah, Mia, your question, and then also just um, Libby, were you going to give a quick update on the vaccination thing? I can. Yeah, if you could do that, that would be great. I just as an update, we had had discussed this at a couple of meetings ago. More information came out from the administration, so um, I thought it might be good to get an update and see if we still want to um, kind of weigh in with the administration. So, you know, can, can, question. can I also add to that? And I spoke with Libby about this, and and she asked that I just bring it up at the meeting. In addition to the vaccines. Can you also talk about the governor's proposal to return all school staff and students back to in-person uh, full-time and what that would mean for how you interpret that for our district as well? Okay. Um, great. Mia? Uh, my question is about the policy that was in the um, consent agenda. Um, I think it's the one that we talked about at the last meeting. Um, the removal of policy D15, is that to get started on the process or is that the start and end of the process that we just removed a district policy? I believe that's the start and end of the process, correct? I would recommend the policy committee check in with the VSBA, but from my limited knowledge because we've never actually rescinded a policy under my superintendency so it's not positive that um the policy committee reach out to um sandra cameron over at the vsba just to make sure um that that is the process that you just have it as consent some at some point and if it's different then we'll correct it okay thank you Okay. Um, Libby, you want to give those two quick updates? Sure. And when you say vaccination, just to be clear, Jim, you're talking about vaccination of educators, correct? Yes. Uh, so the, the state um, officials have, as probably most of us know, um, talked about prioritizing people based on um, death rates, uh, which is completely and utterly understandable. Um, so they've prioritized 75 and above right now. Um, they have a limited supply, which is apparently increasing under the new administration. However, they still have a limited a supply of vaccinations and they need to decide how best to use that limited supply. Um, the CDC has recommended that educators be part of the uh, 1B. Uh, Vermont doesn't seem to have a 1B. Um, they're now in the second phase, they're calling it. So they're using different language. Um, and our state has decided to not abide by the CDC recommendation and go rather with uh, vaccinating first 75 year olds and above, and then going to 70 year olds and above, and then 65 year olds and above, and those with um, compromised systems that put them at a higher risk for our um, more intense COVID situation, which is completely and utterly understandable. Their goal is to reduce death, um, which I applaud and I'm right there with them. Um, that does, however, leave our educators out and other essential workers who are not healthcare workers out of the fold for vaccinations for the time being, 
what we know right now is that educators will be able to be vaccinated when their number is called, essentially, when their age is called. Um, and that's the knowledge that we have at the moment. Um, however, the state has given themselves an opening to re-examine their decisions once they get through those priority categories that they've named uh, and, and thinking about where they will be then with the number of vaccinations that they have available to them. Um, I don't envy their position in making these decisions in any way, shape or form. And I understand the decisions that they're being made. However, when statements like students will be back full time in person in April are made um, and educators are not prioritized for vaccination, it has our educators scratching their heads um, because they are with um, many people, many more than the average white collar worker is on a daily basis in very close contact um, every day. So. Um, those two things seem to be at odds for our educators right now. And that is completely understandable as well. Um, so that's where we are with vaccination front. Right now, educators are in the same boat as every other community member who is not um, 75 and above or not in one of those categories. We do have some educators who have been vaccinated. There was a loophole with the healthcare worker piece where they didn't where the state didn't specify healthcare social workers or healthcare guidance counselors or healthcare speech and language pathologists. And we use that loophole to get as many of our people vaccinated as we possibly can. So, um, and I call it a loophole, it probably wasn't, but um, I don't mean to make that sound like a negative political statement in any way, shape or form. So, but some of our guidance counselors, some of our social workers, some of our speech and language pathologists we got them the information they needed and they were able to get a vaccination. Um, and our school nurses have all been, had their first shot and will be getting their second shot very, very shortly. So we do have some school personnel who have been vaccinated because of um, what the guidelines have been. Um, as far as reopening, Andrew's question regarding reopening schools in Vermont, the governor and the secretary of education have made the statement that by the end of April, um, schools could be back in session full time. They have not given any changes to the guidance around that piece. Um, so we're at in a little bit of a limbo state. And in addition to that, the way that we designed our system, which ha we have a remarkable bit of evidence that has worked up until this point with only one interruption in our schooling um, up to this point, and that was in very early October. Um, uh, and that was only in one building. So three of our four schools have not had any interruption in services to students and one was very short lived. Uh, we designed our system for the full year based on the guidance that we were given um, and based on the safety guidelines that we were given. Uh, there is no way that our high school could change what they're doing right now because they moved into a quarter system. At this point, they're in quarter three. They started it last week. So kids have taken half of their full year course loads at this point, and they're in their third full. So basically their sixth course, full year course load. Um, end of April, they will have completed 75% of their school year and with 25% left because of the quarter system. And it's just not possible to bring them back full time and say, and know what they're going to do for it. They would have to do, the full year course load in that day. And I'm sure Amanda, who's a guidance counselor, can speak a little bit more eloquently than I can because she knows the schedule much better than I do around the high school. In regards to our K-8 buildings, right now with our pod model, if we were told that we had to bring all students back um, to full-time instruction, the first thing we need to consider is that 18% of our K-8 students are in a virtual world. And I don't believe many of those parents would want to come back. Um, some would, but most wouldn't. Um, they don't feel comfortable yet, especially with they, that their kids and their teachers would not be vaccinated at that point. In addition, we would essentially have to reorganize our students so that um, because of our pod model and because we designed our staffing based on the number of students who wanted in-person versus the number of students who wanted virtual, we would have to completely reorganize classrooms so that Susan Koch, who's also here, 
would have a different set of students than she does now potentially um, because we'd have to reorganize our grades of kids into classes to make them e even across multiple teachers. Um, that's not what's best for kids in the end of April with six weeks left of school. Um, so my, um, the way I am choosing to look at what is coming out of the state right now is that the state is speaking to systems like the ones my children are in, my 12 year old is in, where he is only going to school for two days a week and he is virtual for three days a week, that he will have more in-person instruction. Our kindergarten through eighth graders who have chosen in-person instruction have had a full year of school in-person instruction. Yes, it's a shortened day. Um, however, they've had a full year in school and our data does not suggest that there's any learning loss happening right now for our in-person students. It is not what would be best for students and children and families in terms of consistency um, or our staff for that matter, because basically overnight we'd have to reorganize school again. Um, so uh, from our perspective, we have a system that has worked. We have safety guidelines that are working and we have evidence of that. And we have learning, considerable learning that is happening in our um, in-person instruction. And there is simply no way for us to change that schedule in the end of April, even if all the guidelines change and all the safety guidelines change. So I would be highly recommending that we would uh, stay the course for the, for the last six weeks of school, keep, keep kids as they are, keep teachers as they are because they're comfortable with this situation right now. Um, most likely teachers will not be vaccinated by April uh, based on the number of vaccinations the state is receiving right now and how they're prioritizing those vaccinations. Um, so uh, that's where we are right now. However, I just had a leadership meeting this afternoon and we all agreed that we are once again in a, in a place where we need to start making decisions without having all the information we need to make those decisions. Um, so we will, be, we will be muddling through that as an administration team again. We're talking about how we can communicate out to, the, to our families and start that communication now. And, um, and, and we certainly are, are in the beginning stages of, of redesigning our schools once again for the fall, assuming we can get all kids back in school um, for the fall. Great, thank you, Libby. Um, Amanda? Kind of unrelated to this, it's, it's one step back. So I don't know if people have questions or I just, I just wanted to thank the members of the public for being here. Uh, I really, really appreciate um, and like really hope that you come every meeting. So I don't know if that was where, where to fit that. It's kind of an abrupt thing, so. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, um, likewise. Uh, yeah, I know, and especially the, the committee members. Um, any any other questions for Libby, Jill? And I'm looking at the raise hand function too, as, so. Um. I just wanted to um, thank Libby for that. I support that 110%. I'm really impressed by what Montpelier has done. I was uh, really thrilled in knowing we were all kind of holding our breath at the start of the school year. Um, because I do feel like we were out in front a bit in in-person instruction. And I think it's been a overall very successful year and a crazy time. I know I can speak as a parent that my child is having a very challenging in the best way possible year. And, um, and I see that in her and her friends. So I, I just, I support that 110% and I'm really proud of Montpelier for, for what we've done this school year. It's pretty great to look at where we are right now versus the angst we were all going through this summer preparing for the school year. So thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, this, this school year under the circumstances has been a tremendous success. And um, yeah, no, likewise, just speaking, speaking as a parent, um, my, my kids are, are thriving this year uh, under, uh, yeah, under conditions that we all were really worried about. Uh, kind of with that in mind, um, it sounds like it might make sense to maybe write another letter or a letter from the board um, expressing concerns about both the, the implications of the opening plan, especially with vaccinations the way they are. Is that, does that make sense or um, yeah. should we wait? I want to, I, yeah, I want to also chime in just to voice my support for the administration. And I think that 
under some very strange and bizarre and unprecedented circumstances, you worked all summer long to come up with something that would be the best case scenario for the kids in the district. And um, I think it would be a real shame and waste of energy, emotional energy and resources to try to shift gears at this point and come up with a whole nother plan. We have a plan that's working. If guidelines change, like distance can change between kids or different spaces can be used or masks aren't worn anymore and those types of changes. But to have to completely shift gears and talk about changing dynamics of classroom, you know, assignments and um it doesn't make sense to do it at this juncture. It doesn't feel like it makes sense to do it at this juncture. So I would do everything within our power on the board to support you in in sticking with the plan that we have through the end of this school year. And I think everyone's eager to get back to normal. And, um, and I share that eagerness, <laughs> and I think everyone does. But I don't think we should do it, you know, um, at the detriment of the resources that we have in our district. Yeah, I thank you for that. I don't, I don't, I, it's not what's best for kids. That That's the bottom line. Susan Koch has made a beautiful relationship with her first graders. And I know that because I know Susan and I know what she does, but she's not going to do that in six weeks with new kids. And then if you move up into third grade, I just, just to further the point, third grade starts SBAC testing, which they have not canceled yet. I say yet, maybe they will. <laughs> but um, so that happens in May. So can you imagine we reshuffle classrooms for our kindergarten and eighth grade at the end of April? So it starts May 1st. Then we put them in SBAC testing and with new teachers and new systems and new kids around them. And then it's the end of school. It's just, it doesn't make sense for us. Um, so if, I think I would encourage the board, if you do write something to the state, it's what what we've designed as a district is working. And it's what's best for kids is to, limit the number of transitions they have to do right now <laughs> um, and keep them in a way in something that they now know and they're comfortable in. Um, and we have lots of evidence around that uh, rather than in this crazy pandemic that we've got our kids in right now, changing it up again. It just doesn't make sense to me. Unless you have my kid, which is only two days of insert person, then he can go to school more. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I was gonna say that exactly that you know I will uh, just like strong strongly suggest that it is our like this is what works for us because of all the work that's been done because that we know what's good for our kids but that some districts do actually want to go back uh, and so like this the or some some educators uh, and those kids that are only going two days a week so it's like two levels one is like the vaccine like. Our educators have been going to school five days a week in our elementary school. You know, like, like we, we want them all vaccinated now, no matter what. Uh, that's one conversation. And the other conversation is like the transition to go. It's like for us, this is what works because of what the great job that the administration has done to get us to where it is. And it doesn't make sense for our kids. That I'm just like, you know, to, uh, to not be advocating for other people that might not work for them. They might want to go back. Emma? Um, just quickly piggybacking on what Amanda said, I think, you know, the only place where I would see sort of making flexibility and, and changes would be for people who chose virtual initially and now would like to join in-person instruction. And if there was, you know, a manageable number of those families, um, then maybe we could allow for that. We don't have the staff. So, we, so if the board is willing to hire teachers for in-person instruction, which we won't be able to hire, we don't have the staff for it. Um, I, I've been in contact with Jim quite um, regularly. We have literally three seats open under the guidance at the middle school, three for three children, and they have to be seventh graders. <laughs> they more, can't I'm be in the other grade. <laughs> I'm more talking about if the state um, issues new guidelines around space and distance and allow, and that would allow for you to increase class sizes again slightly, you know, if those types, and those are a lot of what ifs, you know. I mean, it, it seems like the, yeah, and, and my suggestion is that um, I draft a letter and include it next 
thing in next meeting's packet and we can kind of kind of wordsmith and agree on it and send it out is that just giving districts the choice in April if, if what's what's working now works and maybe giving them a little more flexibility to change if they want to change but um, it seems like a mandate to change it doesn't work for Montpelier um, and it may not work for many other districts as well. Uh, anything else on this? I want to be mindful of time as, as we have uh, a budget presentation and that I know the, the students, I'm sure, are eager to give the SRO presentation. So, um, Andrew. Yeah, just one thing really quickly. And um, we've talked about this, or I've talked about this offline with a couple of board members. But to Amanda's initial comment about the public attendance, I think a major silver lining of the situation that we find ourselves in as a school board is that we've received so much public participation and so much public input and that's a really really great thing it shows how much our community cares about our schools and as we move forward and i imagine when we have our retreat in the summer but over the next year two three i really think we need to have like some lessons learned sessions and figure out how to continue involving the public in this way, whether it's having one in-person, one remote uh, meeting a month, or I, I, I don't know exactly what it will look like because we don't know exactly what the world will look like. But to me, this has been a, made, a, a real positive development. And so thank you everybody for showing up today. Uh, great, thanks Andrew. Uh, Ryan? Sure. So the potential statement we were thinking about had two themes. Um, one, the position to go back to school earlier for most districts, and also the decision on whether, whether or not to promote uh, more support for teachers being vaccinated. Um, we didn't spend too much time on that second piece. I, mean, I just wanted to highlight as we're talking about the school year, teacher schedules, the vaccination schedules, etc. I'm a little bit hesitant to really jump on board with the idea of really pushing for teachers because by the time we get through the 75 year olds and we go through the month long process of the vaccination schedule itself for the um, vaccination person, we're going to be at the end of the school year. Um, it's like that time piece is something for us to consider. And obviously we're not the ones making the decisions about who goes when, thankfully, I don't have that pressure on me. Um, but at the same time, it is something for us to think about as we're making statements. Yes, want to support all of everybody in our district, um, staff, students, everyone for sure. But at the same time, by the time somebody would actually be vaccinated at this point, is it really the biggest bang for our buck as a, a community, as a state, as a nation, et cetera? School year will be coming to an end here before too long. Um, so that was all I just wanted to, as we're right thinking about those two themes, I'm just sharing that one on the second one. And yes, Libby's absolutely right. Less disruption in our schools. Let's not mix yeah. it up. Yeah, no, good point. And I and and maybe as I word it and we can words with it next meeting, we can just kind of link that, you know, a mandate to go back to school does not mesh well with um, not vaccinating teachers, especially if it forces some staff that have chosen to work remotely due to health reasons back into uh, an in-person situation. Um, uh, I think Grant is here and ready to give some, I think, news that's going to be all very welcome uh, on the budget. And that's a, a quick presentation. And then we will um, have the SRO presentation. So um, oh, there you are, Grant. Um, you want to go ahead? And I'm assuming you're going to watch uh, screen share. So I'll let whoever does that do that. Yeah, great. Um, so we actually have some really good news to share regarding the dollar yield and its effect on tax rates. Um, so we have a handful of slides to show and I'll get through this real quick so that you can go in and talk about communication because this will kind of add to the, the need for some communication, especially around this piece. So Libby, if you can go to the next slide. So as you know, the tax rate comp, uh, calculation is a bit complicated and uh, some of the factors are really hard to define. Dollar yield is one of those. I wanted to put together one slide to just talk about dollar yield since that's really what's driving today's update. So the dollar yield is a statewide factor. It's the estimated amount that districts have to spend per pupil in order to have an equalized tax rate of $1 
while also generating enough money for the state's education fund. The amount of the dollar yield should increase each year because inflation goes up each year. The better the economy, the higher the yield and the lower the tax rates. Um, the, or the dollar yield that we are supposed to use is estimated by the tax commissioner on December 1st each year, but it isn't set by law until usually after town meeting day, which is why a lot of times our estimated tax rate ends up being off because it gets set by law well after the budget process is done. So for FY22, some specifics, a little quick recap. The tax commissioner recommendation was 10,763. We anticipated that it was going to be set higher. And so at the last presentation, we were using 10,863. The big news is that House Ways and Means has passed a bill that actually sets it at 11,385. So a huge increase. Um, that increase decreases the Montpelier tax rate by 8.7 cents. And to give you kind of a, a feel for the magnitude of that, if we wanted to cut the tax rate by 8.7 cents without a dollar yield change, we would have had to cut the budget by a million dollars. Um, it does also decrease the Roxbury rate, and I don't mean to kind of belittle that, but Roxbury's rate was already decreasing, so this just makes it a bigger decrease. I will warn, though, this is just house ways and means, so it still has to be set by law, but this is a good indicator. Next, please. So um, the updated dollar yield dramatically changes our tax rates, obviously, but it does not change the overall budget, our education spending, or our spending per pupil. Because it doesn't change any of those things, our budget articles and the warning that was approved and published is still valid because those things only refer to our total budget and our spending per pupil. Those two things haven't changed. So I just wanted to make sure, in case you were wondering, does this mean our warning is bad? No, everything's fine. Next. So we created this slide to define some of the more tricky terms that appear in the tax rate calculation. We've discussed some of these in the past, uh, so I'm not going to go through them. Property dollar yield is, in the, is on here again. Um, but I wanted you to have this because, once one, it's kind of a preview of what we plan to show for the informational hearing, and two, it's... A, hopefully a good reference for you to have in your back pocket as far as if you get questions about the tax rate calculation. And the next slide actually shows the updated tax rate calculation. If you look at this, you'll see that nothing really has changed until you get about halfway down where you see property dollar yield. And that's where the big change happened. That number is $522 higher than it was. And then of course the tax rates are all recalculated. Um, the just to give you, and an, it's not on here, so to, a reminder is if you look at Montpelier's tax rate of $1.78 here, the last time you saw this, it was $1.87. So that's that big 8.7 cent decrease. Um, equalized pupils and, edu and um, property dollar yield you see are still highlighted because neither of those is final. Um, the dollar yield will be set by law. Hopefully, this is it should be close to this since the uh, House Ways and Means Committee took action already. Um, equalized pupils is a is a bit of an unknown, and I don't really have a whole lot of confidence in that number yet. Um, in the past week or so, we've received four different equalized pupil counts. And those changes ranged from an increase of 0.2, which was barely nothing, all the way up to an increase of 30 pupils. Where we stand right now, the last number I got showed an increase of 13 higher than what we're showing on this chart. If that 13 holds, then our tax rate in Montpelier would drop another 1.9 cents, which would get us down to just an increase of 3.8 and the percentage increase would only be 2.2. So we're hoping that that holds and that for the informational hearing, we'll have an even better tax rate to show, but I didn't wanna do anything with it yet because the numbers have just been all over the place. Next, please. 
So these are the updated tax rate impact charts. Um, the text box under Montpelier is just for reference what the uh, numbers looked like the last time we showed it. So for example, $100,000 in property looked like it was gonna be a, an increase of $144. Now it's an increase of only $57. So it's a 60% reduction without changing the budget, just because one statewide factor changed. Um, like I said, hopefully these will be even lower numbers on informational hearing day. Um, you can see in Roxbury, they're very safe. They're, they were already in the negative numbers. They're even further um, in the negatives. So that's very good. And then just one last slide. We always end with kind of a budget summary. So the total budget increase remains 2.8%. The education spending increase remains 2% but the residential tax rate figures have obviously changed dramatically. So Montpelier is now sitting at an increase of 5.7 cents, which is just over 3%, which is, makes me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, and if you take out the impact of CLA, if the CLA hadn't changed at all, the increase would only be 0.7 cents. Um, Roxbury's decrease is now 13.6%, a reduction of 8.5 from last year. Um, so that's what we got for you. Um, as I said, very good news. Um, I was hoping maybe some media would be, be present today so that maybe that would start kind of a new communication process, but um, I may need to reach out to somebody uh, tomorrow to kind of give them the update. But this kind of dovetails into- I saw David here, he's here, don't you worry. <laughs> oh, great, awesome. Um, so this, but this does dovetail into your next topic, which is communicating the budget. Um, but before you get there, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to talk to them. Jill, I see your hand. Yeah, questions for uh, for Grant and yes, Jill. Grant, I was wondering if you could explain a little more why the equalized pupil number fluctuates that much. Because isn't that like a head count based on like the age or special education? Like, isn't that like a hard number? <laughs> oh, Jill. <laughs> oh, no. There are no hard numbers, Jill. Be, be professional, Grant. Be professional. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's important that the board and folks listening understand. And, and, I'm, and I'm actually kind of curious that it's fluctuating that much. Yeah, well, the first number that we got was an increase of 0.2, which kind of makes sense because you can, you know, an equalizing ratio tweak might do that. Some late reporting uh, district might make a minor change. Then it went all the way up by 30 kids, which made no sense. But that was a pure mistake in the spreadsheet that the AOE did. Um, I pointed it out, I expressed concern because our poverty number went up like 20 kids and our poverty, the raw data didn't change at all. So it made no sense. Um, the number that's up 13 now, uh, it's a little surprising that it's up that much. But as I look at like the prior year for how much weighting we got for poverty, it's pretty similar to last year. So I'm hopeful that it's the same. But what changes is the um, statewide data system is really tough for student information. Uh, and so pulling that data in from that new statewide student information system has been challenging and it continues to be. And some districts are late to report and all of that has to get factored in whenever they do this equalizing, which basically brings the total number of kids back down to the two year average ADM. So as any number changes, they change the equalizing factor. The AOE has frozen that equalizing factor, so that won't impact us anymore. The only thing that could impact us is if they look at our data and find out that something got messed up. And hopefully they've looked at that enough times by now that we should be good. But in addition to the just the overall student information system, the other piece that's tricky is your like free and reduced data, your English language learner data, all of those pieces have to be weighted. So like for, if you have an English language learner student, that doesn't count as one student, that counts as 1.2. And so you have to look at all that raw data and make sure that's calculated correctly. So it's not really a slam to the AOE, it's very difficult and challenging, um, but it is a little frustrating. 
And hopefully, like I said, hopefully the 13, the number of an increase of 13 is good. And we'll be able to uh, make that call before the informational hearing and give the appropriate number then. Great. Thank you. And Andrew. Yeah, I just wanted uh, to provide a little bit of context, especially for new board members who might not be as used to these uh, shifts in the yield. This is a really, really big shift because the there are other revenue sources like sales and use taxes, the, the really, really big one other than property tax that goes into the education fund. And when that was forecasted in late August, we had a very different uh, political government situation, economic situation. There was just a, a lot of uncertainty. And so in January, when a new forecast came out and sales and use tax had been performing better and there was a new federal stimulus bill and the, the coronavirus relief funds were extended, all of these positive developments for the economy happened. The sales and use tax forecast was upgraded by like 17.5%. And that accounted for 90 plus percent of the change in the education fund, which meant that it relieved pressure from property taxes. And that's, this is the result of that. So I just, it's, it's all kind of connected because we have the statewide education fund. Great. Um, other questions for Grant, and then we can quickly discuss, um, getting word out on this. And I know that if David is here, that will help and hopefully he'll report on it. Um, great, so in terms of communicating out, um, obviously, you know, um, uh, a story by David would be very helpful. Um, uh, also, Andrew uh, has, has uh, I'm being shameless, sorry. Uh, Andrew has has offered to uh, to write an op-ed. Um, we can also post this and other uh, presentations Grant has given um, on on websites. Uh, I think it's on the district website already, uh, but feel free to share the link um, on Facebook or or Twitter. Um, and yeah, obviously other other ways talking to your community members. Uh, you know answering emails, et cetera, uh, are great ways to communicate this out too. Um, but yeah, obviously this is this is a big change in the budget and um, I, I uh, believe most of us have received uh, received several emails when uh, the, the number was up around, uh, you know, eight, nine percent uh, with some very legitimate concerns about that being um, a difficult number for, for many uh, households. So. Um, so let's think about ways to get out. We continue the conversation next week. Um, any comments on that or, or questions? It will be uh, great to. Oh, can I raise my hand? Uh, go ahead. I think it will be great to um, maybe just like really reach out to community to like asking for like if they have questions before like all this week like. You know, do a Google form with you have questions about the budget coming, you know, like here we are willing to respond to any of the questions that are like because it takes work to go to the website, find each school board member. Then there's like all these regulations that way, which is like really have and, and like get people to to ask questions if they have it before they go. And I mean, I think um, I developed a bunch of questions which I have not sent to Grant. Um, that I had, like that, you know, like, and plus some of the questions that are coming in around, like the Roxbury. Um, so developing that Q and A in the next week or so um, will be really important to just say, why is this Roxbury so expensive, and you know, how did you figure this out, and what, you know, like, what are the things that? So I think like having that as really accessible, plus a space for people that can ask the questions without having to go through the website to find like emails and board members and things like that. Um, so you're suggesting that living around put together like a FAQ? Yeah, we talked about it last, last yeah. month. If yeah, you no, all send me the questions that you're getting, we're happy to do that. 
We haven't yeah. gotten any questions from, from our end. So if, if uh, at least I'm speaking for myself, I don't think Grant has either from the community. So if you, if you email us the questions, we're happy to do that. Uh, Jill. Speaking as a shameless stealer of other people's ideas, is it appropriate for the Montpelier Roxbury School social media stuff that, that Anna does? Have just a, hey, update for in preparation for town meeting, the tax rates are X, Y, Z, because then I can, and others can share that on social media rather than sort of recreating our own message. But if that's not an appropriate ask. No, we've already, we've already got a plan. We, we, we had that well in the works, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and remember, all these all these numbers right now are and will be for a while estimates. So, um, yeah, we are no, waiting for the social yeah. media blitz until we are closer to town meeting day. I mean, I think that's important to say to people. You know, these are, which is a reality that many people don't know that these numbers fluctuate, and that's how this works. And this is why we need a new, <laughs> new system, but. That's beside the point. Um, that you know, I think people need to community people need to understand that that this is where we're at. So that later on, when things change, it's like, "What you said this?" So I think clarity and accessibility are the two things that we need to move things forward. Uh, Andrew, yeah, just. A couple of quick things. So the budget numbers that people will be voting on, those are set. Those aren't going to change. What changes is what to a lot of people is the most important thing, which is what am I paying, which is based on the tax rate. And that's based on all of these different factors. So I just want to clarify that for members of the public who might be interested, anybody who might be interested, that we, the, the budget numbers will not change. It's just the tax impact changes based on these other state variables. And, you know, we have, I feel like we have pretty strong estimates right now, but when you're in this environment of really tremendous uncertainty, there, there, there are fluctuations that occur. And fortunately, the fluctuations have moved in a positive direction. And that's a reflection of the general economic well-being of, of the country and the state. So, just want to put that out there. Yeah. Uh, Ryan. Uh, just a quick housekeeping question. Uh, we've advertised March 1st is our informational presentation date. Have we advertised a time? Is our time set for that presentation discussion? No, okay. I kind of assumed it wasn't, but I figured if it was, we should probably start sharing it now. So forthcoming. It's typically around like a typical board meeting time. Yeah. That's when we usually do it. Can we offer interpretation for that if people request it to make sure that that is front and center, that if people need interpretation for that day, that they get it? Um, if somebody does, I would encourage them to reach out to us as soon as possible so that we can set that up. Can we put that in our communication that if they need that to ask for it? Mm -hmm. Great. Any other comments or questions for Grant? Great. Um, Emma, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce the SRO presentation. Uh, and I'm also going to thank you and the committee for all the great work you've done. I know you've put in uh, a ton of hours uh, and a lot of, of uh, hard work and good thought. So um, thank you and please take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's it's been a really great process and I'm so appreciative of all the committee members and many of them are here tonight. We have Amanda Payne and Will Alexander and Mia Moore, um, Susan Koch, Catherine Nunnally. And then um, we've made a decision as a committee to elevate the voices of students on our committee. So our three student representatives will be taking over for the presentation portion of the evening. They are Edie D'Onofrio, Eliana Moorhead, and Zach Henningsen. So I'm gonna hand it over to them.
Okay. Um, Susan, whenever you are able to present the slideshow, that would come. Okay, thank you. Um, hi folks, my name is Zach Henningsen and I'll be presenting today with Elion Moorhead and Edie D'Onofrio. I'm gonna have to keep my camera off during this meeting for Wi-Fi purposes and I'm super sorry about that. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to share what we as a committee have learned throughout our work within the community in regards to Montpelier Roxbury School District's relationship with the school resource officer. We will be presenting you with student and community feedback an analysis of core values that the community believes to be important and providing you with statistics in regards to employing a school resource officer. Um, we're just going to remind slash tell everybody um, what our committee's charge is. Uh, the charge is the committee will conduct a thorough analysis of the intended and unintended impacts that the presence of police officers and the SRO position has on our community and in our schools. Hi, my name is Eliana. I'm a senior at MHS. And so how did we fulfill this charge? Um, we basically just needed to talk to the community a lot. And we engaged in really rich conversations with Chief Pete and former Chief Tony Fakos. Uh, Mary and Laura gave us a great presentation about trauma informed and racially informed practices. And I feel like the real meat of our work sort of came from these surveys that we sent to the community where we were able to have the stories and experiences of parents, students, um, teachers, all kinds of people. And so those are linked in the com community materials tab, which is the stakeholder and SRO feedback surveys. And so um, after we sent out these surveys and combed through all the wonderful responses, we were able to sort of extract some main core values of school safety um, that the community sort of represents and also that can ground this board and decisions that they make in the future. And so, yeah, we'll just jump right into those core values. Um, these core values were drawn from two stakeholder feedback surveys, which together represented hundreds of people from many different stakeholder groups in the Montpelier Roxbury community. The, this presentation will be grounded in the community core values. So um, we're going to introduce those and further explore them after this. So the first core value we gathered from the community is justice rooted in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And our definition for that is, we acknowledge the weight of history, the realities of inherited privilege, and the urgent need to actively embrace anti-racist practices in matters of equity and justice for all members of this community. And so I have some quotes that are directly from the surveys we sent out and when asked to elaborate on feelings of safety regarding the SRO, a BIPOC female student said, quote, they do nothing for us except confuse and scare kids. People of color are already scared because of what's going on and what we have to put up with in school. Having an officer there standing around doesn't help to make a kid feel safer, end quote. And when asked what makes students feel unsafe in schools, a non-binary, binary LGBTQ plus disabled white student said, quote, more than anything else, cops. They make me fear for my own safety as well as for the safety of others, particularly BIPOC students and staff. Ever since I was in elementary school, there have been armed police officers wandering through school and it's extremely scary and stressful to see that. And from the same question from a white LGBTQ plus female student, cops. Transgender people have a 15% chance of being sexually assaulted by the police, which is much higher if they are people of color. The presence of a police officer makes me feel physically unsafe. And if you'd like to see more of these responses, they are linked in the committee materials page. So next slide. All right. So our second core value of school safety gathered from the MRPS community is compassion, empathy, and belief in each other. Our definition is 
We prioritize community and our relationships with each other. We care for one another and we seek to understand each other's perspectives by working through initial reactions to recognize the humanity in others. We believe we each have important contributions to make to our community and we support each other in doing so. And when asked what makes students feel safe in school, a male white LGBTQ plus student said, connections made with teachers and those in power in school settings, equality of opportunities and a willingness to discuss difficult, important topics. And from a BIPOC Latinx female parent or caregiver, quote, school culture is one of respect, empathy, and one that cares about each other's success and mistakes. And from the same parent or caregiver on what contributes to an unsafe school environment, they said, quote, a culture of punishment where discipline takes precedence over a culture of restorative practices and empathy, end quote. And I'll hand it over to Zach. All right. Um, our third community-centered core value is nonviolent communication built on strong relationships. And we define this as nonviolent communication and restorative practices among our staff, faculty, students, caregivers, and the wider community rely on strong, healthy relationships built by listening to and accepting each other. To do this well, we must regularly evaluate our proficiency at honesty, honestly communicating with and openly, openly listening to each other. Um, and a few quotes um, as we had before um, from a disabled white female parent, quote, I believe honesty, humility, and respect towards students by the adults in the building would go a very long way. The adults learning and teaching nonviolent communication would contribute greatly to a safe and supportive school environment. I believe then students could feel that they are truly listened to and supported in who they are, rather than who the adults believe they should be. Their opinions and thought processes would be valued and thus students would gain agency and self-esteem and want to be more engaged instead of being afraid to engage. If we think a police officer's presence is going to fill that gap in education, I think we are all looking at it wrong. We are then fostering an environment with fear as the center rather than open and respectful communication. People act out when their needs are not being met. We should be looking at that, how to meet the individual needs of every person, unquote. And then from a female white student in regards to having an SRO um, and how comfortable it made them, it's extremely comforting slash calming to know that if I need to talk, someone, talk to someone, someone trained and knowledgeable is there, like a sounding board. And then moving on to our next slide, thank you. Um, the community's fourth core value is student voice, which we defined as, quote, Montpelier Roxbury Public School System is a student-centered learning community which values student voice and creates opportunities for their participation in decision making. The quotes chosen for this value are from a survey done within the student population alone, specifically in regards to how safe they felt with the school resource officer in the building versus the larger community surveys that the quotes from before have been from. Um, from a female white student, quote, a little after the schools were closed, I started having rather intense anxiety that just stuck. So before the school year began, my guidance counselor and me put in place a little plan in case I started panicking and needed to leave, just walking down to the main office. I don't remember if we talked to the SRO about it or ran it by them, but knowing that someone was there if slash when I needed was really comforting. I also interviewed them last year. Very nice, had interesting insights, unquote. And then from a non-binary student, I am inherently distrustful of anyone who A, has easy access to weapons that could potentially harm or kill me, B, has such a large amount of authority in my community due solely to their job, C, voluntarily joined an organization that is rooted in the oppression of minorities, particularly Black people. You'll forgive me if I distrust people who, despite having no reason to do so, could kill me or ruin my life ridiculously easily with no guaranteed repercussions, unquote. Um, and that is the end of that slide, and I will pass it on to Edie. All right, um, so our fifth core value defined by the committee is physical safety. 
and we define that as every student will have no fear of bodily harm, punitive threats, intimidation, or retaliation from fellow students, faculty, or staff. A few quotes from feedback we received that we feel pertain to and resonate with this definition are one from a parent of color. My kindergartner said, Mama, why does that lady have a gun? We'd been discussing police violence at home quite a bit since May. That made us both feel triggered and scared. Seriously, why was there a person with a gun greeting children on the first day of school? And then from a white male student, SROs have the training necessary to keep the school community safe. Teachers and staff members do not have adequate training to deal with many types of threats, both from within the school or the greater community. The SROs help prevent my classmates from threatening the remainder of the class, as well as ensuring that the incident with the individual who robbed the bank went as smoothly as it could have. An SRO also would have been a valuable resource during the potential election turmoil. And then on the next slide, our sixth and final core value that we identified is system-wide standards and nuanced approaches that recognize and support an individual's whole well-being. The definition we came up with was we set system-wide standards based on a broad range of individual perspective and experiences in order for the standards to fit and work for everyone. We understand that individual experiences will affect how we approach meeting the standard. We bring a holistic trauma-informed approach to accountability and resolution of conflict in order to strengthen each individual in our community well-being. Um, so these quotes are responses from surveys put out by the committee for the purpose of gathering feedback on the community's feelings about the SRO. And the first one was one that I believe Eliana already um, said from slide one. A non-binary student wrote that police make me fear for my own safety as well as the safety of others, particularly BIPOC students and staff. Ever since I was in elementary school, there have been armed police officers wandering through school and it's extremely scary and stressful to see that. Um, and then a response to the survey question, what makes you feel unsafe in schools from a BIPOC male member of the MRPSVT community? Lack of human resource officer and computerized security system. So now I believe I'm passing it off to Catherine on the next slide for considerations. Okay, I'm gonna start with um, talking about the benefits of keeping the SRO position. Um, one of the benefits would be that this position fosters communication and cooperation between schools in our district and the Montpelier Police Department. Another is that the SRO is a resource with specialized knowledge beyond what faculty might have. Um, they can assist on home visits, provide legal information, direct support, uh, provide direct support to faculty and staff and also facilitate in safety drills. Uh, the intention of the position is to help keep students out of the criminal justice system. Um, and from the feedback uh, we received, some staff, students, and families feel more safe with the SRO. Um, the relationship with the SRO helps some students get through school without turning to criminal activity. Um, the SRO can be helpful um, and it's helpful for them to be familiar already with families when situations in which police are called for uh, happen and can help with domestic situations involving children. Okay, next, uh, the benefits of removing the SRO. Uh, removing the SRO is a way to act on our equity values and to follow through on our district's plan, our policy. Uh, it, it can remove barriers to education for students and families who have shared the very presence of an armed officer is such a barrier. Uh, there are a myriad of alternatives that exist that our system could move to besides having the SRO. It opens up uh, the conversation for more creative thinking around safety, justice, and restorative practices to better, better prepare our learners for life beyond school. Um, it can um, 
remove harm from these students. One of the examples of an alternative is a liaison to fill needs such as an emergency response uh, and communication of incidences where students are involved. Um, another benefit to removing the SRO would be eliminating negative power dynamics. And I will pass it to Susan. So I'm going to talk about um, some other considerations that didn't actually fall into e either category, but we really wanted to raise awareness about, the, about these considerations to the board. So one of the considerations was that student voices should be centered in safety related discussions and decision making. And we're really happy to have the students help with that right now. Um, another consideration is that the MOU between the district and the city needs to be rewritten as it predates any current administration. Superintendent Bonesteel and Chief Pete are trusted to manage the paradigm shift of a new system if necessary. The board should present a clear alternative to existing procedures if the procedure, if the position is eliminated or changed. Um, one model that we found really interesting was the district liaison officer model at EWSD. It's an alternative to an SRO, and that um, you can find that in the um, committee materials. Um, information. There's some survey, somebody surveyed some folks from that district, so you can find that there. Um, if the SRO position continues, then raising the Black Lives Matter flag becomes performative allyship without substance. substance. The SRO's work requires consistency, a nuanced understanding of situations, and adaptation to complexity. Um, another comment was that school staff is already taxed and should not be overloaded. Training specific to the SRO should be expanded to all police officers. We heard some arguments that um, um, an SRO would, would have certain training to deal with children and youth, and the belief of the committee is that that training should be extended to all the officers. Um, the existing role of an assistant principal has changed over time, and how does that fit into this equation? Um, there is a lack of granular data in Vermont, and experts advise the committee to extrapolate from the national data, and Mary and Laura have lots of information to share on that. Um, the SRO role requires trust to function, and that trust takes time to build. And though the SRO does not make disciplinary decisions, their presence can be used for discipline and intimidation. The sight of an armed, uniformed police officer is for some a source of fear. The mere sight can also trigger global high activation, causing nervous system dysregulation and re-traumatization. So those are all things for, that we'd like you to consider when you're in your decision-making process. And I wanted to say one more thing. I'm sorry I passed over an important point on um, benefits of removing the SRO. It can create a safer school environment for BIPOC and LGBTQ plus students with disability and students with disabilities and help them feel more psychologically safe. Thanks, Catherine. That, I believe, is my turn. Um, I have been tasked with reading the executive summary, which is lengthy. Um, I'm not going to read everything in the document that was posted online, in part because some of, the, some of that material has been covered already during other parts of the presentation. Um, also, there are some very recent additions to the text in response to some feedback and requests for clarifications that we got just recently. Um, as covered, the work began with a survey to a variety of stakeholders on safety itself. Um, and the results of that survey um, in its entirety are linked um, for your perusal. Students, families, faculty, staff, and members of the MRPS community at large articulated safety concerns. Patterns emerged. Um, 
the presence of firearms on school grounds, regardless of who carried them, was the second most frequently cited concern from parents, for example. Bullying was the first, which is interesting. Um, within that, as illustrated by many of the quotes already shared, which I won't repeat now, um, many of the respondents who identified themselves as LGBTQ plus and or BIPOC also identified SROs as the specific source of their concern. Um, and a recurring theme throughout our research is that SRO programs disproportionately impact LGBTQ plus students, BIPOC students, and students with disabilities. Our next step, um, we gathered questions from community, me community members regarding school safety and the specifics of the SRO position and then collected answers from the Montpelier Police Department, Superintendent Libby Bonesteel, MRPS staff, MRPS community members, other Vermont schools, advocacy organizations, and other experts. Superintendent Bonesteel and Chief Pete provided detailed descriptions of SRO duties and responsibilities <clears throat> and made it clear that they were very willing to um, cooperate with the MRPS board and community in order to protect students, staff, and the community with transparency and accountability. It is noteworthy that the description shared did not match the outdated memorandum of understanding. Um, it has already been mentioned that that should be looked at and possibly completely rewritten. It is also, <clears throat> excuse me, noteworthy that no official complaints regarding the SRO have been made during the superintendent's tenure. Um, many comments and responses from school staff members also praised the former SRO, Matt Nisley, for his demeanor, training, and expertise. Positive relationship building, trust, and connectedness are clearly essential to the work of a student support team and to feeling and being safe in schools. Members of the committee interviewed school administrators in other districts regarding the duties of the SRO and how they're handled elsewhere and learned that most Vermont schools distribute those responsibilities among social workers, counselors, and principals. Research shared by Mary and Laura, which they mentioned earlier during public comment, gave us specific numbers. 59 schools in Vermont had one or more SRO as of 2017, the most recent available data. 247 did not. A lack, speaking of data, a lack of local data emerged as a universal frustration among practically everyone we spoke to in any capacity. The former MPD chief Fakos described much of the SRO work as confidential and unquantifiable. And both the ACLU of Vermont and Vermont Legal Aid expressed concern that detailed information on the impacts and outcomes of the SRO program has not been collected locally. In the absence of that information to work with, experts and advocacy organizations warned us against Vermont exceptionalism and urged us to extrapolate from national data. Many also cited a 2015 study conducted by Vermont Legal Aid called Kicked Out Unfair and Unequal Student Discipline in Vermont's Public Schools. Um, that study is online and linked in the resources. Um, and it concludes that, quote, when it comes to school discipline, rates and disparities, Vermont is not faring better than most other states. Vermont students with disabilities and students of color were two to three more times two or two, three times more likely to be excluded from school through suspension and expulsion. And these disparities persisted for restraint, seclusion, and referral to law enforcement. Now, to be clear, we got some questions on the part I just read, so I need to briefly elaborate. School resources are not involved in suspension or expulsion decisions. That quote is not included as part of this presentation in order to link those disciplinary actions to the SRO positions. Also, here in Montpelier, we should take <clears throat> excuse me, justifiable pride in the fact that expulsion has been extremely rare. Nevertheless, in the absence of specificity in local data, we have to extrapolate from the information that we do have, and this is how we have done that. National studies indicate that BIPOC students, students with disabilities, and LGBTQ plus students are disproportionately impacted by SRO programs. Local data, such as it is, confirms that students with disabilities and students of color are disproportionately impacted by disciplinary decisions in general, including referral to law enforcement. The civil rights data collection records for 2017 in the Montpelier District indicates that students with IDEA status on file, that's Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, represented 
21.1% of the student body, but 66.7% of students referred to law enforcement. Biracial students were 7.5% of the total and 100% of those referred to law enforcement in Montpelier. LGBTQ plus identity was not federally collected. Now, we do not know the substance of those referrals to law enforcement. We do not know the outcomes. We will not presume to speculate about either. The statistics I just cited do not constitute evidence of any SRO misconduct, bias, or even involvement necessarily. They do, however, stand as local and recent evidence of disproportionate impact and further indicate that we should not indulge in Vermont exceptionalism or even Montpelier exceptionalism. As Vermont Legal Aid puts it, quote, Vermont is not immune from racial, ethnic, and disability-based bias and discrimination. Related to this, the executive director of ACLU Vermont also informed us that no empirical study to date has demonstrated the safety benefits of SRO programs. Um, and Laura Murch mentioned this during public comment as well. Um, it was confirmed by documentation from Vermont Legal Aid, both in their open letter to Vermont school boards and superintendents of June 2020 and in other materials and summaries of school safety research. Quote, there is no evidence that police in schools make schools safer. Um, and the independent research conducted by Mary Zantara and Laura Merchants, um, they already referred to, so I will not repeat that now. Anecdotes of SRO encounters collected from this community provided a range of both positive and negative experiences. The range itself is interesting and potentially troubling. Um, it showed a lack of consistency in SRO involvement, availability, and the application of restorative justice practices. Um, the inconsistencies also suggest the community expectations of both school administration and SRO authority may significantly overestimate the limits of their purview, both after hours and off campus. Um, SROs are not on duty 24 seven, for example, and cannot be expected to be. Now, in the anecdotes, intimidation emerged as a significant theme in a couple of different ways. Um, some families described the SRO as a trusted and familiar face who made difficult experiences far less intimidating for affected students. Others described scare tactics employed by a former, not current, administrator of UES who requested the presence of the SRO in order to deliberately intimidate a third grader during a disciplinary meeting. We received some questions about that last paragraph. Um, why didn't we emphasize the positive interactions and outcomes more fully? Um, firstly, I believe that we did. To be a trusted, constant, and familiar advocate in a frightening situation is no small thing. And to have made that situation less intimidating is the important accomplishment to emphasize. Secondly, well, we got more anecdotes of negative experiences than positive ones. So more details would not have communicated a sense of balance. Third and most important, the elementary school incident described above, the single incident, was selected for particular emphasis because it illustrates a power dynamic directly relevant to our charge, one that does not reflect poorly on SRO conduct, but illustrates the impact of SRO presence. This is, this is important to clarify as much as possible. The guidelines provided by Chief Pete do help clarify that school resource officers do not make disciplinary decisions. This is often emphasized and should be. However, the incidents with the third grader described above illustrates how an SRO can become a disciplinary decision by their mere presence or the threat of a disciplinary decision. That anecdote did provoke some outrage, um, at least on my part, on behalf of the SRO, as well as the student and his family who were deliberately intimidated. Our interpretation was that the former administrator put honorable service to dishonorable use. That incident is also noteworthy because it provides an illustrating example that reinforces the survey feedback from LGBTQ students at Montpelier High School quoted at the very beginning of our presentation. 
I'll refer just briefly to one of them, quote, the presence of a police officer makes me feel physically unsafe. And therefore illustrates how easily disproportionate impact occurs independent of officer conduct, judgment, or decision making. This point, again, was further reinforced by Mary Zintara and Laura Merchant's um, research and overview of trauma-informed educational practices. The mere presence of a school resource officer on school grounds can be and has been traumatic to students, especially to students who belong to those three demographics in particular. And in that heightened state of alert and alarm, learning becomes neurologically impossible. I understand that that wording may seem like an explicit recommendation or position statement. I can only assure you that this is an accurate summary of both our process and what we learned. Um, in very briefly, this committee found <clears throat> this committee found anecdotal evidence of positive beneficial interactions with the SRO as reported. We also found both anecdotal and empirical evidence that SRO programs are detrimental specifically to students of color, students with disabilities, and LGBTQ plus students. The, empir the empirical studies, and there are a lot of them, are among the resources we provided. They are not balanced by an empirical demonstration of SRO benefit because those studies do not appear to exist, either locally or nationally. During one meeting, a member of this committee expressed gratitude for the DARE program, a precursor to the contemporary SRO program, and concern that we are, quote, raising a whole generation of kids to fear the police. That concern might well be accurate, and we may share very serious concerns about the erosion of trust in law enforcement, but we cannot deny that that distrust is present in our district. And this debate that we are having right now is not the cause. The summer of 2020 subjected all of us to constant viral footage of police brutality that had a searing impact on public consciousness. An atmosphere of fear and distrust will compromise the ability of any SRO to establish a rapport with vulnerable students. It also compromises the educations of those same students. In closing, the School Safety and Police Relations Committee commend the board for giving their time and talents to serve the MRPS community, and we appreciate this opportunity to attend to the press and community concern. There is still important work to be done, whether you vote to retain or remove the SRO position. As Chief Pete said in his interview with Laura Merchant, quote, there needs to be clearly defined boundaries of what the community wants from the police department. We as a subcommittee remain committed to that work and in the second phase of our charge, we'll provide a broader report on safety through the lens of the district's diversity, equity and inclusion policy in order to better fulfill MRPS's mission to ensure that, quote, our schools are caring, creative and equitable communities that empower all children to build on their talents and passions to grow into engaged citizens and lifelong learners. Thank you for your patience. Um, we, so thank you for your reading from me. That was really good. Um, we want to just remind the committee and anyone here um, of what we and the community as a whole believe that you should ground your decision, whatever it may be, um, in these core values. Um, and that is all i have if any of my fellow presenters or committee members have things to add go for it and if not i believe we have another slide about questions if folks have questions Yeah, so open it up to the um, board for questions. Um, and uh, so, good, uh, Amanda. Sorry, I have no questions. I just want to 
really, really appreciate um, all the work that you guys brought today, the voice of the community. And um, yeah, I'm blown away. I think that is very comprehensive and I really just want to thank you for that. Yeah, no, and likewise, it was um, very well put together um, and uh, really appreciate um, the hard work. Emma? I just wanted to say that Eliana Moorhead has volunteered to sort of um, help popcorn the, the questions. If board members have questions, um, she will help direct those questions to who is probably best suited to answer those questions. So I would encourage questions from the board. Uh, Andrew. So I also want to echo what Amanda said. Thank you everybody so much for your effort, time, energy, empathy, everything that you put into this. I know it was, um, it's been, it's been a bit of a process and it's clear that you really considered, uh, you, you really, you really considered this issue from a range of perspectives and um, really put equity front and center, which is something that the board has been striving to do now for the past several years in terms of how you focused your energy on this. So I want to just echo what Amanda said and thank you very much for your effort on this. I, I have I have some smaller questions, but my my larger question is, and I don't know who would be best to answer this, but my larger question is, so this is the presentation on the SRO and uh, considerations surrounding the SRO specifically in the second phase. It's my understanding that you're going to kick the tires on essentially what Chief Pete asked for, which is what does the community want police to look policing to look like. And I guess um, my, my larger question is, what does that look like for this committee focused on schools versus is there going to be a larger effort at the city level? Because, you know, we're, we're the school board and we, we really do, obviously these city considerations impact us, but, you know, how does this all come together? Emma, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, yes, I've actually been in touch with some people who are working on on a um, committee that's working with the looking at um, policing as a whole in our community <clears throat> and juvenile interaction, school interaction is just one. I think it's like one twenty fifth of the items that they're looking at, like different type, different um, ways that the police interact with the community. So at the city level, there is a process that's just beginning. And they have asked this committee um, to sort of be the voice for that part of their work, um, which I haven't really brought to our committee yet because we've been so laser focused on the first part of our charge that we haven't really spent time on the second part of our charge. The second part of our charge reads, um, provide a broader report on safety through the lens of our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. So we imagine over the next couple of months meeting um, regularly as we have been to work on that part of the charge and then come back to the board um, when we're finished with that part of the charge to make further recommendations. Thanks, Emma. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, that does. And, and I realize that that uh, matrix that you all put together about the, you know, why might you want to keep the position? Why might you not want to keep the position? And then there are kind of considerations that some of them, it's my understanding just, just from reading it over the other night, that it seems like those are just general considerations and some of them, it's not a big deal if they conflict with each other, is that right? That's just, you're just representing different perspectives there. Is, I'm, I'm talking at the bottom of this. Because on one hand, uh, and, and I'm just thinking from a board perspective, there's a consideration that the board should present a clear alternative to existing procedures if the position is eliminated or changed. And I really think the board would, would look to the work of this committee and look to our administration and to, to come up with that. Um, I don't think that's something that the board would do on its own, but at, at the same time, I also see uh, just near there, it says superintendent bone steel and chief Peter trusted to manage the paradigm shift of a new system if necessary. So those, I'm just wondering, are those, 
So how, how that, do we interpret this? I think um, the way that I would interpret it is first to, to the first part of your point is that we spent some time on consider considered recommend considerations to um, for you all to think about when you're making the decision. And there were sort of considered recommendations in favor of keeping the position and in and in favor of eliminating it. And so that's how we decided to break up the recommendations. And then there were was you know some information that we didn't feel information statements feedback points that we didn't really feel fell firmly into one category or the other it um or maybe it was biased or anecdotal so we put it into that third category for just you know here's some more stuff that the committee wanted to say about this but we didn't really feel comfortable putting it into one category or the other and then in terms of the work of the committee for the second part of the charge you know, I imagine that we're going to come up with um, some pretty comprehensive recommendations of how to move forward with um, a fair and equitable system of discipline and justice in our schools. And then I think the statement that you're referring to is just that we do have tr trust and faith in the administration um, and the police department to carry those out. You know, we we don't think that, um, you know, it would be extending the purview of the committee or even the board to be making very explicit directives of like, you need to hire, you know, 0.5 of this position. Or I, I don't think it will get into that level of specifics because um, as a committee, we've discussed, you know, we do have um, faith and trust in the administration team and the police to take the recommendations and then do what's best for the district. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, Jill. Thanks, just real quick. I, I know you guys probably hear platitudes like this from you know, educators, your parents, whomever, but Eliana and Edie and Zach, we are so indebted to you as a community um, and what you've just done for the hundreds of kids that are in this community. Um, I think it's really hard to articulate. It's not easy to sort of kick the rocks over and see the ugly sides of our society and call it out and be um, and handle it with such grace and maturity. So I really appreciate how um, balanced and um, and illustrative your slides were about the different things that you heard. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of our community for everything you guys are doing. Um, and I just wondered, Real quick, I know we have a lot of folks with a lot of questions, but I'm curious to know if you guys felt like you heard sufficiently from fellow students. I'm assuming the same survey went out to, I know I took it as a parent and a board member. Um, I'm wondering if you felt like you got a good sense from students, if you had more time, do you think there's anything else that we should be doing to hear more from students or staff? Um, I didn't see a lot of comments from staff. I'm wondering if, if you felt like you heard enough from them. I'm um, just wondering your sort of impressions on, on the survey and if it got you what you needed. Thank you. Um, I can take that one. Edie and Zach, you can feel free to jump in. But honestly, like, we got a good, re I feel like we got a pretty good read on the student population, but a lot of the students who responded were, like, white female students, and I really wish that um, I had, ha we had had more, we can build this in, but, like, just getting a lot more BIPOC and LGBTQ plus feedback would have been really helpful. Um, because they are disproportionately impacted by this. So yeah, um, I feel like we definitely, the core values we found are representative of the whole community, but like, yeah, just elevating specific voices a lot more than we were, we were able to. Um, to add, just to, just to, oh, go ahead. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, to add to what Eliana was saying, I agree with all of that about um, a lot of the student voice we heard was white. Um, but also with that said, I was very pleased with the responses we did get. It was honestly a little more than I expected um, being a student myself and just sort of like, you know, sometimes seeing the reply all chain under a survey sent out to the whole school. Like it's, um, it's easy to see certain things in the school environment and feel like really there's not a lot of people who care enough 
to, to, you know, give their honest feedback. Um, and I feel like we did get a lot of that, although there will always be student perspectives and voices that we don't hear, but I am very glad that we heard all the ones we did. Thank you. Hey, Amanda. I agree with, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I agree with that, Edie. I feel like I def I wasn't expecting to get as many like in depth responses as we did, especially from students who weren't necessarily like directly impacted by the SRO. Like they were able to extrapolate just on like society at large and just like I don't know. I feel like it was a really good moment of reflection for a lot of students and myself included. I'm just, yeah, I'm just going to jump in here just for a second because I heard a question about educators being represented on the survey and that was the work that um, Amanda Payne and I did and we we really took some time to interview um, at all the schools, all four of the schools, we interviewed staff and uh, faculty and um, that information is included in your media packet as well. Um, and we found it particularly helpful to um, talk to school counselors and the school counselors um, had a lot of really interesting information for us. And the big message I got from the school counselors I spoke to at Roxbury and um, Union School was that um, they are not on 24 seven. So they need help um, for the kind of work they have to do, especially um, with um, you know, things often happen outside of school hours and then are brought into the school setting. So to help kids access learning, um, we need to take care of them. And so um, I just wanted to make sure you knew that that voice, that part was in there as part of the survey. Thanks. Yeah, and I just wanted to add too that I when we put out the survey, it was around the vacation time. So we didn't get as many responses from I would say like faculty and staff. So I would love to have more time to, to be able to get more of their voice. Um, it's, it felt sort of rushed. And, and same with students. I think if we just had more time. I think we could get a larger, um, a larger voice. But I was impressed with how many people did respond given the short time, time frame. Uh, Amanda. So I'm a little um, confused, Emma, about the, the conversation around, well, now we kind of like trust the police and then paraphrasing, obviously, and the administration to kind of like take the next step. But, and I guess that's a question for the whole committee. Isn't the next step to provide an alternative? Um, like that's the whole idea of like remove and replace with what? And is that, so when you, is that, are you saying like that then the administration and the police are the ones that are going to decide what the alternative looks like or am I not understanding that correctly? Um, I mean, I don't want to speak for the whole committee before we've even delved into the second part of our charge. So it's a little bit hard for me to um, be put on the spot about work that we haven't done yet. But Let my... Clarify. I, I just yeah. want to... I'm not putting you on this fan, just I want to understand that comment that was made. Yeah, so I'll clarify so, my comment. Let me just ask as a question. What is the next The next step is to what? Now we're going to decide if there's going to be an SRO now or not, and then what? Well, the way, I'll, I'm just going to read again, like the way that it's worded in the charge. It says to provide a broader report on safety through the lens of our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. So I believe that that will include recommendations of how to proceed. You know, so if we decide tonight that we are removing the SRO, we would make recommendations of how to proceed in the absence of, the, of an SRO. How, what types of systems we would like to see in place of the SRO position. And if we decide tonight as a board, to keep the SRO position, I think we would still have a lot of recommendations to be made around how do we want to see that, um, 
that position moving forward. Um, because I think throughout this process, we've realized there's definitely changes that need to be made. Um, so those would come in the form of a recommendation. And then it really it's just about um, how the board operates in relationship to the administration team. And there are limits to the powers of the board and the powers of a committee, right? So the power of the committee will be to make recommendations. The power of the board will be to maybe vote on those recommendations, make policy out of those recommendations if needed. And then the power of the administration, which, you know, it seems like the sentiment of most people on the committee would trust the administration to move forward with those and then make decisions accordingly to carry out those, those recommendations. So it's really That's more of like a structural, thing. it's a structural thing where um, the committee doesn't have the power to say, we want you to hire a 0.5 social worker, you know, or, or community liaison was a position that we've looked at a lot. You know, the committee doesn't have that power and I don't believe the board even really has that power. So it's about making recommendations and then the board taking those recommendations and voting on them or creating policy around them and then um, the administrative team carrying them out. Thanks, that's clear. Um, other questions or comments? Great. Um, so do we want to move to a vote on what to do with the recommendations? Do we feel we need more time and information? Um, I'm happy to entertain any sort of motion anybody wants to make. Emma. I do just wanna make, um, make space <laughs> um, for any of the committee members who, if you're holding on to something right now that you feel wasn't said in the presentation or any sort of closing thoughts that you might have um, as a person that's been serving on the committee since October and has heard and processed a lot of information that if there's something that you're sort of holding on to in this moment, I think now would be an appropriate time to share that as long as Jim agrees. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, no, I didn't mean to sound committed on us, but so you did a great job. Edie of playing traffic cop with uh, the commentary and um, making sure that everyone uh, was heard. So thank you very much for doing that. Eliana <laughs> played the. Or Eliana, sorry. Yeah. And Will and Catherine, I know as you know, it's not like you guys had all this spare time, and I'm incredibly grateful for the time and effort you guys put in. I was really glad that you were appointed to this, and I didn't want to <laughs> exclude my thank you um, to you guys as well, because I know it's a huge amount of work and it's a lot to wrestle with on top of um, life. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, also also to our administrators and to uh, educators who assisted with this and support staff. The students still deserve most of your thanks, but but we'll take some, thank you. Susan, did you want to make a comment? I see your hand is up. You want to make a comment. You know, it's been a really um, lovely opportunity to participate in this group and I've learned a lot. And um, I have to be honest, in the summer, I. I, when I heard the idea of not having an SRO, I got a little panicky because I was like, whoa, I sometimes use the SRO to help with safety issues in my classroom um, about once a year, to be honest. And then as I worked with this group and I learned information and I learned about schools in our state and I learned about some of the feelings and the, the um, feelings of, of not being safe, um, I, my heart broke when I heard about kids in our district um, not feeling safe at school because of um, an SRO in the school, it really was upsetting to hear that because our my whole career has been to help kids feel safe so they can access learning. So um, one of the things that was really intriguing to me and I would recommend that the committee um, look at is the Ex Essex Westford School District. I think that's what it's called. I'm not positive of the name of it. Um, they have created a role that works for them. They've created a school liaison role. And um, it kind of, in my eyes, it kind of takes the best of, of the function of the SRO 
and removes the weapons um, and removes some of the disciplinary um, um, sort of power type situation. And the liaison, um, we have in our materials the charge for the liaison, and it's to work on communicating with families and helping the school district navigate situations that are that are tricky. Um, and it, it includes working with school counselors and social workers. And so I just wanted to share with you that I was really moved when I came upon their model. And it was really encouraging to hear that there are models out there working. It's a new model. They don't have a lot of data collected yet. But it seems like um, it's something that we as a district could think about is um, moving in a direction that's a slight shift to protect our kids and to keep um, our students safe because the most they're the most important thing in our district. Um, so thank you all for allowing the space for this committee to do that work and I'm really excited to keep working. Good. Kevin? I'll just second what Susan said that I may have come into this um, with my own biases. And after listening to all the testimony and the evidence given, um, you know, I can't dismiss the voices of the students and the families and the community members. And I do feel like we have been um, exposed to alternatives that in the MRPS context, uh, may serve our schools better than just having the student resource officer that we could um, you know there's a great potential for successful outcomes when we have a focused collaboration among school staff students parents community organizations and agencies community members at large and you know the police department is going to have to probably be a part of that because we are going to have crisis situations we're going to have a criminal activity to deal with safety concerns and also prevention activities. So, um, you know, that's going to be a piece of this. And that's why we included that um, Chief Pete and the Montpelier De Police Department are going to be have to be at the table to collaborate with the next step. Um, but, you know, I do think there's there's a lot of potential to create a new safety model that could have greater beneficial outcomes for our students and our community. Great, thanks, Catherine. Um, other comments, I see Mia has her hand up. Uh, Mia? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Susan and Catherine for um, sharing that and particularly for um sharing and you know being vulnerable in that way to share um your shift in thinking and the the journey that you went on um through this process um because uh i think you're um demonstrating for all of us the the work um that we need to do and uh, and i just really appreciate you sharing that with all of us excellent Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I echo all the, the thanks and the hard work um, that everyone put in and the thoughtfulness. Um, so I pose the question again, are we feeling like we want to take action or do we feel we need more information? And if we are feeling like we want to take action, um, uh, someone needs to, to can, can I just, oh, sorry. Just uh, yeah, Jill and then Andrew. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say real quick that on the agenda, this was posed as the presentation from this group. So I don't know. And I know our budget is already set and locked down with without yeah. an SRO funding. So I'm 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 a little unsure yeah. what the vote would be at this point rather than in a few months or something. But just curious. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the question I wanted to pose too. I mean, do we feel we took action? already for this year by not having it in the budget because right now we do not have an SRO position. Um, so we can just, I mean, that could be our action. And um, 
uh, or we could charge the policy committee with with coming up with some sort of policy around an SRO. Um, I think, or yeah, or we could could table it. So um, I think those are kind of the the three things. Um, I think Andrew and then Mia, and then I see Emma with her physical hand up. So uh, Andrew. Yeah. So I was just about to ask something very similar to what Jill was. And um, yeah, so I'm just, you know, the SRO, we don't have an active SRO right now in our schools, no. correct? No, and we, we don't have an SRO in our budget, correct? Yes. So, you know, in, in some ways we've already, you know, we've already made this decision, but we could memorialize it. We, and if we kick it to the policy committee, what are we asking the policy committee to do? I'm not entirely clear on that. Um, especially, I feel like we might kick something to the policy, maybe kicking it is the wrong term. We might send something over to the policy committee uh, once we have the second round of information from this committee. But right now, I guess the question would be, you know, what would actually go to the policy committee? Yeah, and um, yes, we may want to wait until we get a further recommendation. Um, Emma, I believe your hand uh, was up. Next. Um, I believe that this community and the committee deserves for the board to take definitive action around the school resource officer position. And I don't think, you know, what happened with the budget was um, a little strange and confusing, even to me, who's very entrenched in this process. So I think, um, you know, whatever happened with the budget in terms of sort of removing funds from, from that position, I think that was sort of a separate issue that actually wasn't, you know, it was formally voted on in the, in the form of, of approving the budget. But um, I think that the community deserves after this process that's um, gone on now for many months to hear from the board whether we are going to be moving forward as a district with an SRO or without an SRO. And I think that information will be critical to the work of the committee as we proceed in the second part of our charge. We, if, if we're making recommendations of how to proceed, the whole time it's been this sort of like confusion with the committee of, so are we going to be making recommendations of how to improve the school resource officer position or are we going to be making recommendations of how to move forward with a completely new system in the absence of an SRO position? So I was very eager for the board tonight to, to definitively make a decision. Jim, you're muted. You're muted, Jim. Yeah, uh, you can make a motion to that effect as well. Right? Or that. I don't know if you want to do that now or later. Um, uh, I think Amanda is next, and then Mia, and then Andrew. I think I think Mia, Mia was first. Yes, Mia. Right. Um, I don't want to repeat anything Emma just said. I'll, I'll plus one all of that, and the, the what I'd like to add to it is that. Um, the budget decision to do it while I um, support that is, is feels to me like a temporary one, like something that could be undone um, next year. Um, and I do recognize the confusion that the board might be feeling because it's not as if the board ever took a vote to create, to, to establish an SRO position. <laughs> so I do, I do kind of understand that we feel like we're kind of on, um, you know, maybe uncharted territory. And so uh, perhaps the way to move forward is that it is simply a resolution of the board that um, that we as a community recognize there is no need for an SRO in our schools. And therefore we state as, a rep as representatives of this community that we don't want to have one, ought not have one, how, you know, however way we want to wordsmith it, we can. Um, but it feels like that would be the de definitive thing we could say at this point in the process, while there still is 
not um, at leaving open work for the policy committee to maybe follow through on our district policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I could definitely see a very strong policy having to do with um, how discipline and policing shows up in our schools and or doesn't um, that follows the um, the the very strong um, uh, lead of that of policy F22. And that can be further down the road, but I definitely would say for tonight, we need to make um, a, uh, a, 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 a statement that recognizes the work and recognizes the um, where we are all at as a board. Um, I'm ready to make that motion, though I don't know, as you can probably tell, don't exactly have the wording exactly right, but I also wanted to leave space for those who have their hands raised. Um, I believe Amanda is next. Yeah, so, well, first, I, again, I'm just going to say that I'm so proud of the community today. Um, three years ago, we raised the, the Black Lives Matter flag. Yesterday, um, we raised it again as the anniversary, anniversary um, for those of you that didn't know. Alumni and current students of the Racial Justice Alliance worked hard to get the Black Lives Matter flag flown again. Uh, we did a run. We started a um, move and read um, for Black Lives um, thing where you can sign up and I will send that information later. But, you know, we are like making it out of a priority to make sure that our Black families are really welcome, that our LGBTIQ students are really welcome. So today I, I want to honor all the work that was done by all the community members in Montpelier, by those who filled out surveys, by those who made phone calls, by those that were concerned, um, that for, by those who learned um, and changed their hearts. And I, with that, say I wanna move, make a motion uh, to remove the SRO position permanently from the district and begin the process of replacing the critical functions and increasing safety of MRSPS students. So that's my motion. Um, and that's what I have. Second. Right, Mia, second. Um, that moves us to- Can, can you, this. Amanda, can you just repeat uh, the, the motion part just because my internet cut out and I want to make sure I hear the whole thing. The acting, huh? Oh, kidding. <laughs> I move to remove the SRO position permanently from the MRPS district and begin the process of rep replacing the critical function and increasing safety of MRPS students. So we've got a second from Mia. Um, that puts us into discussion and Andrew, do you want to yeah, I'm, I'm all I'm all for that motion. I think we need to take direct action. So um, I think I think that was well put. And yeah, I, I think based on everything we've heard and I read all the materials that this group produced, I, I don't see how I, I can't come to another conclusion than to support that motion. So. Great. Um, any other Jill. Yeah, and I, I want to be really clear. I was in no way suggesting that we not. I was more literally, I'm, I'm a kind of a black and white person. I literally was wondering what resolution I was um, going to be voting on. So now I know and, and I third it. Thank you. Right. Amanda, is your hand up or is that from oh, previous? That's from before. All right. Uh, any other discussion? Excellent. Um, let's do a vote. Emma. Aye. Jill. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Mia. Aye. Amanda. Aye. Aye. Uh, everyone's mixed up. Uh, Jerry? 
You still with us, Jerry? She may have had to drop off. Um, are there any other board members I missed? I know Anakit is, is out. Excellent. The, uh, the motion passes. Um, thank you, committee, for the fantastic work. Uh, it's a great result, and we're really looking forward to um, hearing back from you uh, in the second phase. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, great work, and I think that's a great result for the district and a big step forward for our equity and, and uh, diversity and inclusion work. So um, that uh, was, was wonderful. So thanks, everyone. Um, we have one last order of business before we adjourn, and that's um, the policy monitoring reports, approval of policy monitoring reports, the E11 travel reimbursement, um, and the F10 uh, participation of home study students. Um, do I have a motion to approve those two reports? I move that we approve the monitoring policy reports in our packet. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion about the reports or questions? Emma. Aye. Jill. Aye. Brian. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Mia. Aye. Amanda. Yes. Um, I think that's everyone who's still left. Um, policy monitor reports are approved and uh, next order is motion to adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Can I have questions tonight? I move we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I uh, just invite you to move and run with the Rage Justice Alliance? You can purchase the t-shirt. Uh, at cost, and you can take pictures of yourself while you run an exercise. Read uh, there's a there's a list that we can send you to read about Black History Month, and then on the 17th we were gonna end with a poetry jam session with uh, Black authors, um, Black poets from Vermont. So um, I invite you to join the Racial Justice Alliance Club, who's been doing really great work and. Um, celebrating this month and um, yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you for that, Amanda. Uh, I think we got a motion to adjourn from Jill. We need a second. A second. Great. Uh, Emma. Aye. Jill. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Uh, Andrew. Hi, Mia. At only 10 minutes after our uh, um, scheduled ending time. Yeah. I. Amanda. Yay. Yeah, great. And just for the new newish people on the board, the, we are we only do the individual roll calls because of Zoom. Um, when we get back in person, it will we just do a universal iron and it takes like a tenth of time. So. Um, it's warning you that we will not have to do this cumbersome routine forever and anon. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, especially to the um, to the uh, safety committee. Um, great work. Uh, really something to be proud about, especially the students who uh, did so much so much prep on the presentation. Um, so thanks all, and we will uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Good night. <laughs>